Uh, welcome to Meet the Author. My name is Diane, and I'll be facilitating tonight's program. My colleague, Lisa, will be moderating the chat. I am very happy to introduce tonight's speakers. Michael Kleber Diggs is a poet, essayist, and literary critic. His debut poetry collection, Worldly Things, won the Max Ritvo Poetry Prize and will be published by Milkweed Editions in June of this year. Among other places, Michael's writing has appeared or is forthcoming in Great River Review, Waterstone Review, Poem a Day, Poetry Daily, Poetry Northwest, Potomac Review, Hunger Mountain, Memorias, and a few anthologies. Michael is a past fellow with the Givens Foundation for African American Literature, a past winner of the Loft Mentor Series in Poetry, and the former Poet Laureate of Anoka County Libraries. His work has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net, and has been supported by the Minnesota State Arts Board and the Jerome Foundation. Hadara Barnadab is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Poetry, the Lucille Medwick Award from the Poetry Society of America, and other honors. Her award-winning books include The New Nudity, Lullaby with Exit Sign, The Frame Called Ruin, and A Glass of Milk to Kiss Goodnight. She is also the author of two chapbooks, Fountain and Furnace, awarded the Sunken Garden Poetry Prize, and Show Me Yours, awarded the Midwest Poet Series Prize. In addition, she is co-author with Michelle Boisseau of the best-selling textbook, Writing Poems. She's a professor of English and teaches in the MFA program at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And with that, I'll very happily turn it over to Michael and Hadara. Thank you, Diane. Go, go ahead, go for it. Okay. Hadari, I could not hear you um, just a second ago. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Um, I was just saying, we're gonna start off with a short reading. Uh, Michael's gonna go first and I'm gonna go after. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So- We're gonna um, to turn hello. off that mute. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. And Hadara, thanks so much for being in conversation with me tonight. Thank you, Helen and Diane and everyone at Johnson County Libraries for making this possible. Um, I'll start with a couple of poems for tonight. I really wanted to begin with um, words, a poem I wrote for Words of a Feather, which is an anthology that was put together by the Kansas Humanities or Humanities Kansas. And uh, I was invited to be part of it by the editor, Megan Kaminsky, a poet I admire a great deal at Kansas University. So I wrote um, a poem about Kansas called Ode to the House Sparrow. To common creatures, bodies so plain they may stay unseen, beauty that reveals itself with time, rewards all faithful attention to city things and country things, society, joy in prattle and chatter, to seldom heard discouraging words, neighborly ways, easy association with passers-by. We are never alone. To everything that sings because it's happy, because it's free, a free state chorus, a soundtrack of every day, to enjoying the abundant land, to stewardship, maximizing each seed, every breadcrumb. Sometimes in winter, you find them thriving, warm somehow within a barren bush. You may walk by, distracted by a shiny thing, or you may stop to visit, join them in harmony, gay, knowing they persist near you, breasts rich, golden, brown, limestone, shale, black, healthy soil beneath a ready field of wheat ripe sorghum plum for harvest. There are many objects of obvious splendor, but consider the moon in reaping season. See ecstasy expanded in a fleeting flush of red, color that promises to leave. Offer instead your earnest praise to that which is capable of awe, but chooses simplicity, shares its beauty in plain song. It's a, you can't, it's, 
you can't see it, but it's a concrete poem. It's shaped like the state of Kansas. So just really leaning into my home state love and um, couldn't imagine starting tonight without beginning with that poem. I'm going to read a few from my book, Worldly Things, which came out in June. Um, Hadara was part of it. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, but this uh, first poem is called I Love My Neighbors As I Love Myself. I drive around admonishing strangers. Hurry up, I tell them, or wear a helmet. Kids needing parental guidance get it from me. Teens at black in black clothes at midnight, sensed but not seen like owls, receive my words as care. When I spy an elderly woman with her coat worn loose, I don't hesitate to yell, button up. I want the best for her. I learned of love in harsh commands, curt rebukes, and tired, ravenous hands. The rear view holds ancestral eyes, ravaged, not mine. The hard hand sending the window down isn't mine. It's mine. Love is history plus desire. Love is dominion. It's supposed to attack you. When you send it out, it stings you back like a slap of cold air. Sometimes it arrives in the form of a man driving away, shouting. My book is... Um, about three things really, it's about my family, it's about who I'm from, it's about where I live, and by that I mean America, and America in this moment in time, a racialized America. Sometimes I mean the upper Midwest or my neighborhood. And then I also write about where I'd like to live, the kind of world that I'd like to inhabit, um, a, a more communal place, a more empathetic place, a more loving and vulnerable place. Um, I'm going to read two more poems uh, from the book. This this first, or this next one rather, is um, is from the section about who I'm from, and it's about my father. and And by way of warning, uh, my father died uh, as a crime victim when I was eight, when my twin brother and I were eight. And I I mention that in this poem, which is called Superman and My Brother, Spider Man and Me. My brother and I were born to educated middle-class parents 11 days after Martin Luther King's assassination. Our home aspired to nonviolence, no gun culture, no guns. Even then folks knew black boys in a white city needed more than their parents' desire to stay safe. They understood about misunderstandings. Even then black boys were shot in parks playing games children play. So when we turned eight, instead of squirt guns, we got puffy superhero heads that sprayed water from their mouths when we pulled the trigger. We delighted in comic book legends spitting on our friends at our behest. It was the white boys on the block with their pistols and revolvers that always shot harder and farther against Superman and my brother Spider-Man and me. We gave as good as we got until we were exhausted. 1976, the bicentennial year. Summer suggested it would never end, but autumn always comes. One month before our birthday, our father was shot and killed in his office. He was a dentist. I tell you that for a reason. I use educated and middle class for a reason. I don't want you to think our dad had it coming. I want you to focus on something else. Our parents' designs were undone anyway. There is no sanctuary in the theater. Lost for months in our bedroom, our desperate island, we began to confront a loss that reveals itself still spent our allowance on comic books, dreamed of rough places made plain, tried to hew hope from a mountain of despair. And I'll close with um, a poem called The Grove. And it's from that third section. It's aspirational, it imagines 
a different kind of world. Planted here as we are. See how we want to bow and sway with the motion of earth and sky. Feel how desire vibrates within us as our branches fan out, promise entanglements, rarely touch. Hear our sweet rustlings. If only we could know how twisted up our roots are, we might make vast shelter together. Cooler places, verdant spaces, more sustaining air. But we are strange trees, reluctant in this forest. We oak and ash, we pine the same, the same, not different. All of us reach toward star and cloud. All of us want our share of light, just enough rainfall. That was beautiful, Michael. What a pleasure to hear your work after reading it so um, intensively, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, I'm going to read um, a couple poems from my latest book, The New Nudity, and then um, read a couple um, short poems from a new project I'm working on. Um, so this particular book looks to um, objects and body parts for inspiration, trying to find um, life and energy and love in all kinds of unusual places. Uh, this first poem is called Door. It actually kicked off this entire book project uh, and is in response to Apollinaire's door. Hung by two pins and swelling, lacquered and puckering, effaced by thumbprints sealed with grease and ink. Your quick hands cancel my gunmetal lock. No one notices my head. No one soothes my forehead with a cool cloth. You handle me. He handles me. My gold protuberance available by turns. I am legless and cannot move. I am tongueless, mute to your touch. I unleash my deranged triangle of shadows when pushed. If you look under my skirt, you'll see the darkness of another world. This is the last poem in the book, Zombie. So I thought I was going to write about all these objects and um, my, you know, my poetry self always loves to mess with me. I think I have an idea of what's happening and something else happens. So. You know, first I start, started out with doors and um, wine glasses. Then the body parts snuck in, like a thumb or leg. Um, but then weirder stuff snuck in, like wind. How are you supposed to write a poem about wind um, as an object? And then here, here we have zombie, because why not zombies? Which are kind of, I guess, objects? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> in any case, this is zombie. A zombie is a head with a hole in it, layers of plastic, putty, and crust. The mindless must be sated. Modeled men who will always return, mouthing wet promises. You rise already harmed and follow my sad circle as if dancing on shattered legs. Shoeless, toeless, such tender absences. You come to me ripped in linens and reds, eternal, autumnal with rust and wonder. My servant sublimate and I am yours, the hot death we would give each other. My dark ardor, my dark auger, 
love to the very open-mouthed end. We are made of so much hunger. So um, I'm going to read a couple of um, short erasures. Um, and Michael actually has one in his book as well. And there are many different ways to approach them. So erasures are typically when you take a work. It doesn't have to be literary. Sometimes it is, sometimes not. So you take a written text and you extract language from that text. <laughs> Sorry, that's my giant poodle. Um, it happens. Um, so sometimes people will cross out text so you can see the text ghosted behind. Sometimes it's whited out or blacked out. Um, I opted, I'll hold this, hold this up quickly. I opted to um, pluck text out and then try to arrange it on the page so that it mirrored what I was erasing. Um, so I was a medical editor for a few years and my newest manuscript um, looks at medical and pharmaceutical um, industries and intergenerational trauma. So um, I actually wrote these based on package inserts, that those weird kind of um, origami <laughs> folded up into tiny little squares in eight point font that you're given and nobody reads. Um, but as a medical editor, I used to write them and edit them and um, they were part of my lexicon for years. Uh, so um, this is from the Tretinoin Gel or Retin-A package insert. It's called Your Mind is Night. Your mind is night. Your eyes open wounds. <clears throat> your whole face may become skeletal. Fire is your nature. Flame is your friend. Deep inside your skin, New Zealand white rabbits report excessively troublesome feelings of warmth, inflammatory lesions, peeling of the total body surface, a red blistered day. Question your toxic nature. Question the human risk. Death is excreted in human milk with alcohol, spices, and lime. You can't wash it away. Use extreme caution. You are flammable. So um, just so you know, um, using Retin-A does indeed make you flammable. So if you're a smoker, think twice about that. Um, this um, erasure is based on um, cefriaxone or rocephin. Um, it's from Medline Plus. It's called Infect This Page. Uh, so I based these uh, erasures on, on medications my family had recently consumed in the last few years. And Rocephin stood out to me because my daughter is allergic to penicillin and we she had chronic ear infections. We had to try multiple antibiotics to get her ear infections to clear. And finally, she was given Rocephin, which worked. My father had Lyme disease for about 20 to 25 years. It finally killed him. And um, Rocephin was the drug that he took in massive, massive quantities, which effectively shut down his immune system. And by the time he passed, he was in a nursing home and he just caught a cold and that was it, 67 years old. So um, Rocephin, mixed feelings about this drug. Infect this page. Infect this page. Inject the blood of work. Kill your need to question this garbage art. A written list of all problems of the heart. Someone who is sick is at war. The victim of your normal American diet of disease and pain. Take an ax to your tongue. You should begin to feel better or get worse. Oh, cloudy day. Oh, bloody month. So um, I'm going to pause there and kind of jump back to um, Michael's beautiful poems. Um, 
which I know well, maybe maybe we should jump to that and then yeah. move to questions about the book. I'd love that. Um, so um, I do copy editing work for Milkweed Editions, um, which is the publisher um, Michael's book uh, is coming or has come out from. And I get to work on books that have already been accepted. So they're already brilliant. They're already under contract. Everything's a go. And then they give me a book and say, well, what else do you see? <laughs> and it's this really marvelous opportunity to, you know, look at the whole, look at the book as a vision. Um, and this, as a writer, this is um, something that I find really exciting. I, I enjoy the process of putting together a book. It makes me nuts, but it's also really productive and you can kind of see things across the manuscript and across the poems um, versus when you're just working on one poem at a time. And so um, I was really excited to work on Michael's book. I thought it was brilliant. Um, I said things like, um, worldly things was a joy to read, a joy. It's also raw, painful, exciting, tender, fresh, and brilliant. I wrote wow many times and also love. These poems are really knockout. It's so rewarding to read such a good book and to be swept up in its energy, velocity, and heart. That was my opening for him. I don't get paid to give him compliments, by the way. <laughs> Oh, I... um, this was a, this was my genuine um, response to his work, and then you know I had other suggestions and comments in the poems. Um, so that's what it was like for me to work on the book, to attend very, very carefully, word by word, line by line, poem by poem, and then the book. Um, I don't, Mike, and that's how I met Michael. <laughs> <You're his poem. laughs> Right. That's, uh, you know, I usually meet people like uh, in a public setting and say hello, but this was kind of almost a better introduction. And Hadar, I, for me, um, when I was finishing the manuscript and sending it out, I have to pause for one second to say, not tonight, but I am going to ask you about lime, axe, and art in those erasures. <laughs> Cause oh, just like, of course. Yeah. So expect that. But I, um, okay. when I sent the book out into the world for publication consideration, I, I kind of tried to manifest my intentions. Like what would be a dream outcome for me? And I narrowed the list down a little bit. I'll talk about this more tomorrow uh, as when we talk about path to publication, but I wanted to make a book. I wanted to have a physical object that was very high on my list. I wanted to make a book that I would be proud of. I wanted to work with people that I admired and enjoyed working with. I wanted to have editors who would interrogate the manuscript and make it better. I wanted to learn as a result of their feedback and comments. And at the end of the process, I wanted to have something that all of us, myself, the publishers, the editors, that, that everyone who was involved in its success would feel proud of. And that was it. It was not thinking about winning awards or specific publishers. I just really wanted to focus on those things as part of my growth and development as a writer. And when your comments came back, um, I was so grateful for your attempted attentiveness throughout and um, line level. Some of it is like consistency in, in usage on M dashes and commas, but also looking at line breaks for poets, that's kind of a real key part of it, talking about arrangement a little bit, um, pressing against a couple of titles, uh, really, I think toward the betterment of the book. And I just felt tremendously grateful uh, for your thoughtfulness and thoroughness and uh, learned not long after that that you were in Kansas City. And I just, I went into my whole Jack Johnson, I can tell that we are gonna be friends thing. Uh, after that happened, but it was a really wonderful, positive process for me, but also the realization of that, that wish that I'd kind of manifested as I sent the book out to be published. That's so beautifully said. Um, it also, it also makes me think, um, 
about the importance of revision and of community in the publishing process. So you might have these individual poems that you're working on and working on and working on, and maybe you show them to a friend, and then maybe you assemble, assemble a book and you show yeah. that whole book to friends. But then it doesn't stop there. It's this recursive process that keeps yeah. keeps coming back and coming back. It's a not nonlinear path in a way. Um, right. So even at the point where the book is, you win this huge prize. People, this is a big prize. Um, you're with this great publisher and and still there's feedback. And of course you weren't required to take any of my feedback. Um, and I'm glad I'm glad some of it was um, was useful, but still at the very, you know, and I'll say this, sometimes people publish a book and then they publish a selected books or a, a selected yeah. poems or collected poems and they revise their work yet again yeah. after it's been published in the journal, after it's been published in a book and then they republish it in another book and it's different. Um, right. So, yeah, very much yeah. a recursive process. It really is. And I think about, um, I saw Sharon Olds read in 2019 and she's one of my poetry heroes and she read from a published book and then she said, just a second and took out a poem and edited it right there. Uh, and I was talking to her after the reading uh, and I, I got a chance to tell her how much her work means to me and how much I admire her as a poet. Um, and, and how her courage and her candor in talking about the body and the human experience gives me permission to just be fearless in my own writing. Uh, and we were chatting and I eventually got to the point where I said, I, I just have to ask, what did you, what did you change? And she said, the, the line breaks. She, she didn't like the line break decision in the, in the poem, but it is, it's a process that never ends. And, you know, uh, associated with supporting the book and having the readings. I've got some poems that I've read a, more than a few times and you, know, you get to that 20th, 25th time and you start to think, you know, what if, um, it, it, it never stops. I actually don't think of poems as done. Um, I think of them as ready. Uh, you know, there might be some like more that, that happens kind of, uh, after they've been published or, or included as part of a collection, but, um, yeah, it never, it never stops. It, it never stops. Yeah, it, se it seems that way, right? I was right. just thinking, um, yes, yesterday, my oldest um, poem that I am still working on is 17 years old. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that's, that's rare. That's an oddity. It's a poem about my father and I every couple of years that comes back to me asks me to work on it. And then it's just not right. Yeah. yeah. Who knows, maybe I'll die with this poem unfinished still, which happens. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, recursive, recursive. Mm. So um, I thought maybe we'd um, talk a little bit about worldly things. Um, and I love the selection you read tonight. Just beautiful. Um, I was thinking about how these poems engage with fatherhood and um, you read two of the poems that I had in mind. Oh. Um, I love my neighbors as I love myself, Superman and my brother, Spider-Man and me. But there, there's also the end of class, Coniferous Fathers, Adoration, and Back in Huntington. Um, can you talk about um, fatherhood as a theme in your work? If it's easier to just focus on one poem, that's fine. Or if you have kind of a broad vision, that's yeah. great too. Yeah, thank you for asking that. I. Um, as I was thinking about Worldly Things, the book, and uh, the poems there as a collection and how they were in conversation with each other, I was thinking about my father initially and then found myself kind of thinking a little bit about um, fatherhood in general um, and, and seeing opportunities to think not just about my father but myself as a father and then, of course, fatherhood generally. So... Um, poems in the collection like Conifer's Fathers is just about like, what if we reimagine fatherhood? Adoration is about my father. Um, and Seismic Activities is about my father in one column and myself as a father in another column. Um, fatherhood I see as 
a pathway to have a conversation about masculinity, which is the topic that actually is feels more urgent to me. Uh, the older I get, and and frankly, the older my daughter gets, the more I think of myself as a parent and not as a father. Um, when she was very, very young, there were things that her mother could do for her that I could not do. But as she's gotten older, our role for her is essentially the same. It's to be supportive and loving, to be attentive and present, to be helpful. Um, and those things exist beyond gender. And more to the point, I want them to exist beyond gender. I don't want to be the stern father dispensing wisdom or the stoic person answering the phone and saying, hold on for your mother. I, I want to be an active present part of my daughter's life. And I want to challenge any conventions that suggest that the role of father exists in a particular way, it's particularly where those conventions affect a kind of distance um, uh, from, our, from our children. So that it, it started off about my dad and then gradually kind of migrated toward a, a conversation about fatherhood that I'm still kind of spending time with. In my, in my recent writing, I'm writing a lot about men and masculinity. Um, I, I believe that men are crisis. And I say it that way instead of men are in crisis because I, I don't want to make the focus so much on men as I do on how men have affected the world negatively and the possibility for new models that will um, allow for, for different and better. Wow, that's really, um, really powerful. Um, I love this idea um, as uh, identifying as a parent versus identifying as a father, but then also, um, you know, not shying away from masculinity and issues about gender at the same, that you can inhabit both those spaces at the same time. Right. You can think right. of yourself as a parent and you can still investigate this theme. Right. Um, I also um, I also wondered about um, reading about community, the role of community in your um, poems. So um, as I was reading your book, I was um, thinking about this term. Sorry, I had to plug in for a second there. Um, I was thinking of this term, radical tenderness and radical empathy. So I, I you know, I reread your book happily um, before our conversation. And um, I, was, I was interested in this idea of community as family. And you talked about, you know, so the poem started off kind of personal. You were thinking about your father, then it extended to you as a father. But then you started thinking about, well, no, maybe not. I don't have to be a father. I'm just a parent. So I could hear as you were talking, it started out a little more narrow in focus and then went larger and larger. And I, yeah. I really was able to um, follow that strand through the poems as well. So your first book open, uh, the, your, your first poem opens up with um, the speaker sitting in a car with his daughter. But then the last poem is, is about walking on the street and trying to engage with another person. And so it, sh it looks outward. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about community, um, poems such as Lost in the Crowd, Dispatch from Middle America, um, grinding down to prayer, um, even the erasure as possibilities. Yeah, thank you so much. I, um, you know, there's that, that witticism that we're, you know, poets sometimes just write the same <laughs> poem um, or, or, or nurture the same obsessions. And for me in my writing, in my poems and in my essays, I have found that I'm, very often talking about two things, uh, community mm. and empathy. Those, those two things um, are obsessions for me. And I'll start off, as you, as you kind of talked about it in the creative process, I'll start off really wanting to write about something else and I just find it bending back toward um, the same kind of conversation. And I see community and empathy as two sides of kind of the same coin. Um, I don't think that we can live in community with each other without empathy. 
And I believe that empathy results from living in community with each other, that if what I know about you, I know from being in community with you, um, I'm less likely to be persuaded by um, efforts to convince me that an entire demographic is um, one thing or another. And um, when I get to that, ask those aspirational poems, when I imagine the kind of world that I want to live in, um, I'm, I'm just having that conversation. I'm thinking about more empathetic people, more empathetic fathers, uh, people who live in community with each other and recognize each other's humanity and uh, extend to everyone dignity and respect and, and things along those lines. So those topics are huge for me, just in general. And um, in poem, and I, I, I also see radical empathy, radical kindness, and um, those, I see those as challenging concepts. Um, I was on a panel this summer at the Kansas Book Festival, and I'm speaking on that topic. I was invited to speak on that topic because someone read my book and said, let's have Michael come talk about radical empathy. And um, I, one of the things that we recognize at the outset is sometimes particularly radical kindness calls on us to intervene when we see someone else is being mistreated or harmed or disrespected. Um, and that intervention can feel brisk or unkind. Um, and, and so that concept is really kind of complicated and radical empathy is um, also complicated because it's now, can I extend dignity, grace, space, forgiveness, patience to someone who I might well imagine is out, you know, bent on my annihilation. Um, how far can I go with my own principles? And like all human beings, I'm a work in progress with all of that. But one thing that helps me process it and dedicate myself to it and think about it and spin it around is, is writing um, in the space of the poem and the effort to name it and say it in the poem um, that reflection, that introspection, that time and consideration, and even the tinkering um, allows a kind of progress that feels important to me. Hmm, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to move um, into, I think, a related question um, about your experience teaching in the prisons. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, this is discussed directly in poems such as My Ultimate Thought Is This. Yeah. Um, can you say about how your work in the prisons has impacted your writing, um, maybe your poetry and prose? Yeah, um, significantly. So I started teaching creative writing in Minnesota Correctional Facilities in 2016. And um, I've had the honor of, of teaching with a number of amazingly talented, dedicated, hardworking students um, in correctional facilities all over Minnesota. Um, and I, I think you know this as a, as a teacher, Hadara, in order to teach it, you have to understand it. Um, in order to articulate it, you have to know it. And so um, my study became more rigorous and more intentional as I was working on ways to, to share ideas um, with our students. I also learned a lot of things from them. When I first started, I was thinking, I had, I had some of these ideas that I look back on now and I'm just like, Michael, Michael, but I was, one of them was, I'm never going to offer a prompt that reminds the students they're in prison. And then I'm like, well, that's absurd. That, that reality is so pervasive. It's, it's kind of impossible, but more than that, um, students tend to write about whatever they want to write about. And one of the things that I really learned, um, I spoke earlier about Sharon Olds. I have so many heroes who just say it, Denise Smith, Hugh Min Nguyen, Sharon Olds, so many writers who just write about their lived experience with what seems like fearlessness and candor. And um, I have so many students that I've worked with through the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop who go into their most difficult room, as we call it, who write about their most difficult moments and their difficult experiences. And their ability to do that provided a lot of kind of courage and encouragement for me as well. Whatever it is I'm going through or dealing with or feeling, uh, it's gonna resonate with some reader. Someone's experience is gonna be similar enough that that poem can be important 
to both of us. Yeah. Um, I was thinking of, of your sharing Hadara about your father and having lost him and the circumstances of that loss and how it has affected your writing in that poem that you're still working on. And guess what? Same, same, same. Um, so I learned a lot in those spaces. I benefit a lot from the energy in that community. Um, I'm reminded also that our capacity for growth and change is um, endless. I have in my time in prison seen people see, who seem quite far away from a return to community, but a number of people who um, have made progress and done great work and um, are really dedicated to their creative writing. And um, I'm inspired in those spaces and encouraged and improved. Um, I, I, I'm taking notes as you're talking and I, I was thinking of, um, you mentioned growth and going into difficult rooms and learning from others. And it took me back to the idea of um, the community as family and radical empathy and also the, um, the humbleness of being a poet and the attentiveness of being a poet. Um, you really, you have to be, you have to be with an open heart. Um, otherwise, I don't know, the writing is a wall. Yeah. Um, you have to be willing to investigate, 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 go deeper, go into difficult spaces. And you're not only doing that, of course, in your poetry, you're doing that, um, you're doing that actively when you, you know, cross these barriers that some other people would never cross. Um, you know, people in the prisons who are sort of dis disregarded, um, you know, treated as labor, um, forgotten. And part of the work that we do as poets is to, is to give voice to the overlooked, to the silence, to cross the, bo the borders and boundaries that we've been told not to, or people are too scared to um, and I, I really respond to that and resonate with that in your work. And I think it's so, so important. Um, this book has a lot of heart. It's very open hearted in a way that's really um, gratifying to be with. I think I actually said that in the end of my, um, and what I read before, it's so rewarding to read such a good book and to be swept up in its energy, velocity, and heart. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an easy way to be in the world, um, certainly, but it's uh, there's room for growth and reward there and also beautiful poems. Well, thank you for saying that. I'm, I'm deeply moved by that. I also feel so seen um, and, and encouraged. I, I have um, I have a, a question that I I like to ask myself toward the point when I feel like a poem is almost ready. And the question that I ask myself is, is it real? Um, Denise Smith, who is a, a poetry hero of mine, they like to ask, "Have I said it?" And um, I've heard kind of different incarnations of the same question, like, "Am I hiding anywhere? Am I?" Um, withholding anywhere. And I definitely had some poems in this book. Seismic Activities is an example. Superman and my brother, Spider-Man and me is an example where the effort to go into that difficult room and stay in there long enough to do the work of the poem took quite a long time. Seismic Activities, um, when I look at my folder for the year that I wrote that poem, I have 47 versions of it, all of it on the way to try to get myself to just say it, to to um, to not hold back, to make it real, to to write with with my my whole heart and and not um, feel a sense of shyness or shame or or holding back, and that can be hard sometimes. It can take time, um, but that's that's really the kind of work I want to do. Yeah. Well, um, you've succeeded. <laughs> also, it, that, that's the work that I think people most respond to as well. 
like the miracle of when you read a poem and you're like, oh my God, that somehow came from my own being. Although yeah. I'm not the one who wrote it. When you feel heard or seen just by reading somebody else's poem, I think it's that the vulnerability, the open heartedness, the working, you know, going into the difficult room. Um, it's not, it's, but it's not an easy path. Thus 47 versions. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about your um, essay writing as well? Um, I know that you're teaching a workshop on, on December 11th for the library and that there there's still openings for folks who want to register. Um, <clears throat> what has your experience with both genres taught you? Um, how are they similar or different? Um, we just have sort of a few minutes left and then we'll need to sh shift to the Q&A, but I didn't want to forget to um, get to your essays. Yeah, thanks so much for that. I, for me, there are a lot of similarities in both spaces. I'm um, trying to be fully present in, in what I'm navigating. I've tried for a long time to find language to articulate what it is or how I know that a moment is going to come across as a poem versus an essay. Um, I've been uh, lap swimming a lot lately, um, and I want to write about lap swimming. I have this idea for an essay called Long Lap Swimmer. That's the working title of the essay. And it's just a space where I can kind of navigate my experience as a Black man, as a person with a larger body, swimming in a public space. And my, um, my life as a swimmer and how much I enjoy that, but also how many barriers I have to kind of navigate in order to be in that space. Um, there's this Ross Gay essay called, Have I Even Told You or Have I Ever Told You About the Courts I Love, where he talks about basketball courts where he's played. And I want to model it a little bit on places where I've, I've been swimming over the years. And I know that's an essay. There's a lot I want to navigate there. There's a lot I want to talk about, different scenes, different moments, years of time uh, in this activity that I love. Uh, at the same time, earlier this year, I was heading toward the pool and um, at, at the YMCA where I swim, the Young Men's Christian Association, emphasis on Christian for this story. And an older woman touched the back of an older man and he yelled, God damn it, at her. And he was very angry, angry and she was chastened and she walked away from him. And as she walked away, she walked past another woman and they shared um, a very knowing look at each other. I have been there. Are you okay? Do you need any? No words were shared, but there, in that glance, there were so many conversations and I was deeply affected by it. And I knew in that moment that A, it, um, I would write about it and it would be a poem um, wow. because that that central image, that that moment, the two women sharing glances with each other is my entry point. And that moment is so vivid. Um, and it's it's what I really want to, to to write around and consider. And who knows where the poem will go. But um, I knew right away that it would be a poem. I enjoy both practices. My poetry has a lot of prose elements in it. I'm narrative. I gravitate toward plain language. I like story structure. And complexity and structure is one of the complexities in my poetry. Um, and my prose includes um, a lot of what I hope to achieve in poetry as well. I'm concerned about meter and sound and and um, image and uh, pace and a lot of those types of things in my prose writing. But I definitely enjoy both. And both for me are kind of centered in personal experience. And so personal essays, personal poems, uh, that's, that's kind of the space I tend to navigate. Great. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to look at the time and um, I don't know if, if do we have um, questions for the Q&A? Um, if not, I thought we could also, one of the things that Michael and I talked about um, mentioning um, in our conversation were poems and poets whose work has sustained us during the pandemic. Um, but if there are a bunch of questions, I'm glad to shift gears. I, I can't see that. From there are my, yeah there are a couple of questions. questions yeah so one is 
can Michael talk a bit more about the death of his father? Such a horrifying, sad story, but he extracted such a beautiful poem from that tragedy. And can Hadara talk more about the death of her father? Both of these writers have turned heartache into amazing art and humanity. And Hadara, would you like to respond to that? Oh, um, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, I, I think my, my father has become one of those obsessions, the sort of the reoccurring loss. Um, and, and I would say a reoccurring presence at the same time. So he passed away in 2007 from complications related to Lyme disease. Um, my previous book, Lullaby with Exit Sign, um, is is largely elegiac, so you know poems in honor of the dead, and and very much engage with his life and his illness and his death. Um, and I will say um, that particular book helped me not be afraid of the dead, helped me not be afraid of ghosts and. Um, there were writers who made me brave. Um, Natasha Trethewey, um, Claudia Rankin, Emily Dickinson, especially Emily Dickinson, whose poems I sort of incorporated into the work, um, that there was a way that you could take endings, death, et cetera, and you could write through it. There, you could survive this experience. The poem could survive it and I could survive it. And still, I think there's so many silences around, um, so many silences around death. People are so scared of it. They don't want to talk about it. Um, and, and I think, you know, poetry is there to help us talk about things that are really difficult to talk about and that need language. So um, that book kind of opened the door for me on listening to my ancestors, channeling them, being open to what they need to say to me. And uh, that ha that tradition has continued. I still, I still hear my father and um, he still calls me to write, to write poems. Yeah. And um, this is the gift of poetry. Um, it makes me listen more and larger and better. Um, like my ears have become giant. Um, and not always, but I think um, when I'm writing well, my ears are turned on. Yeah. Oh. I um, I respond and connect to so much in that Hadara. I, Natasha Trethewey's Thrall is a touchstone work for me. Yeah. Um, and, and, and of course, for, for anyone who's writing about losing a parent, um, her, her, um, her memoir, Memorial Drive, is is the same. It's, um, uh, in fact, how funny I have it right here. Um, but th th these works, um, spending time with writers who are having the same conversations and neg negotiating the same kind of loss has been really helpful for me. My, my father will be a theme in my writing for many, many years. There's so many conversations I want yet to have um, about my father, about loss, about grief, about memory um, that are connected to that event. Um, and my mother, who's still alive and lives two miles away, uh, uh, also will feature and features a lot in my thinking and writing. Um, but for me, I've, I've, I've gained th kind of the same thing, Hadara. I don't want to call it power, but um, for so long, I was not able to talk about it. I started writing poetry in 1999. The, f the first poem where my father shows up is Superman and my brother, Spider-Man and me, which I think I wrote in 2016. So there's, there, and there was some time off there for, for, for parenting, but um, yeah, I took, when my daughter was born, I took five or six years off from writing. But other than that, I'm writing about everything except <laughs> my father. And then I'm like, oh, you remember those squirt guns we had? And I wanted to write about that as a way to talk about gun violence. And then here's my father. And I, I specifically remember sitting at my desk, working on that, reaching that juncture and asking myself, are we going to go or veer away? 
um, and deciding to to write it, knowing um, that it would be difficult. I yeah, shared it with my room. writing. Yeah, yeah, that difficult room. I shared it with my writing group, and they're like, "Wait, is this a true story?" Because I never mentioned it, never written about it, or anything else. I knew the first time I read it out loud, my voice would crack, or I might need to step back um, and and just wait uh, before I, I read it again. And finding the the ability to to voice that, to say it, to write it, to edit it, to do that work uh, ended up being really important. Thanks for the question, Lynn. And Diane, I see you coming in to- Yes, there's one more question. I think uh, if we can answer that uh, um, briefly from Amanda. She mm -hmm. asked, do you feel like parameters like making a concrete poem help the process? Uh, so yes, so in, in a concrete poem, just to reiterate it, is a poem that has a specific shape. And you might not be able to see it terribly well in this uh, chapbook, but this this concrete poem is shaped like Kansas. Um, and uh, I I knew early on, so the, the, the idea for the anthology is to write about birds. And um, I chose the house sparrow I wanted to write about a common bird because common birds were meaning so much to me at that point in the pandemic. And I also was thinking about plain things, underappreciated things, and how significant they are. And um, I hope no one will be offended if I say when I think about Kansas, that's kind of what I think about. It's this beautiful place, but its beauty is not as obvious as, say, you know, parts of Alaska or Hawaii. Um, and so I wanted to write about the significance of beautiful things. I early on had the idea that I was going to shape the poem like Kansas. And yes, I think that form, that writing concrete poems, that visual poetics, that all constraint that we embrace in the creative process provides a, it's like a forced bloom. It, it, there's so much that can blossom in those confinements. Uh, and, I think that had I not written that as a concrete poem, it would be radically different. So it's it's both that it helps the creative process, and I think it also shapes uh, the creative process. So um, parameters, and, and, and one other thing, if I ever am kind of at a loss for things to write about, this has not been an issue for me for quite a long time, but if I ever am making up rules like, I'm going to write a poem with no gerunds. I'm going to write a poem with um, as much color as I can put. Like whatever rules you can kind of come up with can a lot of times force you out of a writer's block and into something creative and unexpected. All right. Well, I think that'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Michael and Adara, for being with us this evening and for that really interesting conversation. So much food for thought. And I mean, you're poems that you read are just real zingers to the heart. So, so thank, thank you so much for sharing those with us. And we, we just really appreciate your, your taking the time to be with us this evening. Thank you so and much. And I want to tomorrow night. Um, and then Saturday morning is Michael's workshop, Writing the Personal Essay. And you can find information about this and other library programs at Joko. And that ends our program. Thank you all and have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.